This is the Ecotricity's Ecotech Roundup show from Aotearoa's first and only climate positive certified renewable electricity provider. We only source from wind, hydro and solar and we are the leading supplier of electricity to electric vehicles in Aotearoa. Switch today at ecotricity.co.nz. Welcome back to another roundup of news from the world of clean cars and green energy. Thanks for joining me. We start today's show with a story that's US-based, but which will have an impact on the whole world, the official inauguration of Donald J. Trump as the 47th US president. I know many will be frustrated that we're actually covering this, but given its wide-reaching consequences, we feel we need to. Aside from strongly condemning the actions of Tesla's CEO during Monday's official celebrations, We'd like to focus on the slew of executive orders signed by President Trump on day one. In addition to curtailing and removing civil rights across the nation for many, he announced an immediate withdrawal from the Paris Climate Accord and the World Health Organization. He leveraged a legal loophole to declare an energy emergency, granting oil and gas companies free reign to drill on previously protected federal lands for fossil fuels and announced a halt to leasing federal land for wind or solar firms. And because it was a federal emergency, he declared, he gave the US government and military free power to seize land using eminent domain. He's instructed various agencies to freeze handing out funds previously earmarked for renewable energy and EV projects and has announced an end to what he called President Biden's EV mandate, which was in fact not a mandate, but a goal of having at least one half of all new vehicles sold in the US be electric by 2030, a goal which wasn't actually legally binding. Many of the executive orders signed on day one are based on thin legal premise, so expect plenty of court cases to come, and we'll try and keep you abreast of them as they happen. Following on from that bombshell, we're already starting to see the impact of Monday's inauguration on the wider EV world. Sadly, While this is happening in the US, its impacts will be global. In California, the California Air Resource Board announced that it has withdrawn its request to the EPA to allow it to enact proposed advanced clean fleets rules, rules that would have required heavy haulage firms in California to transition to zero emission vehicles for fleets that were quoted as well suited to electrification. Also this week, Stellantis-owned Ram announced that it will be killing its plans for a long-range 500-mile capable Ram 1500 REV electric pickup truck. Instead, it plans on focusing on promoting its plug-in hybrid variant for long-distance use and saving a standard-range model for Ram town use. It's not clear, though, if that model will actually end up making it to production in the current political climate. And it's not just Stellantis. This week, Nissan confirmed its shelving plans to produce a rogue-sized electric crossover SUV for the US market. While it plans on bringing a similar model outside of US to production, I think it's pretty clear that automakers are lining up to take advantage of these changes in policy. And I'm sorry, we have another sad piece of news to cover here as well, namely that US-based EV startup Canoe is officially out of money and has ceased all operations. As you might have guessed from last week's show, the signs have been there for a while that Canoe was in financial trouble, having furloughed most of its staff before the end of last year. As announced on Monday, the company, which was in the process of trying to satisfy loan requirements from the US Department of Energy, was unable to meet the conditions set out in the loan offer and therefore wasn't able to obtain any of the funds it applied for. Rather than enter into Chapter 11 bankruptcy, which would have given it more of a hope of survival, it's entered into Chapter 7 bankruptcy, which focuses on liquidation of the company assets to recover debts. There's also been no further news on allegations that the firm was owed a substantial sum of money by its CEO, but we should expect further investigations into the matter, given the fact that last year the firm spent more than twice its annual revenue on private jet flights for said CEO. Then again, this is America, so yay. To happier news now, courtesy of word of an impending deal between Hyundai and General Motors that would see Hyundai rebadge commercial electric vehicles to sell to GM. While both brands are growing and have pretty robust portfolios in the passenger vehicle EV marketplace, 
GM is said to be interested in buying commercial vehicles from Hyundai built on its ST1 EV business platform. Designed for a wide variety of uses and engineered to come in box van, refrigerated van and chassis cab variants, it could help GM fill the gap between its current electric pickup trucks and its Chevrolet Bright Drop offerings. Forming a partnership would also allow each firm to save some serious money on EV development and perhaps even allow continued development and production of EVs at a time and a rate where the US federal government is expected to become very anti-EV. The world of eVTOL has been a pretty shaky world lately and had a bad end to 2024 and start to 2025. But this week, Chinese firm Ehang was celebrating a new milestone for the company. According to the firm, its EH216S completed a successful inaugural demo flight in downtown Shanghai, carrying passengers without a pilot on board. The flights were made possible after the company received the first types certificate, production certificate and standard airworthiness certificate from the Civil Aviation Authority of China. The firm says it plans on establishing eVTOL air taxi services throughout Shanghai and in other cities along the Yangtze River Delta in the coming years, which is part of a wider plan from the Chinese government to establish Shanghai as a leading hub for eVTOL operations by the end of 2027. Ehang already has a base of operations at the Longhua Airport in Shanghai and plans further transit hubs in the coming months, although it is still only conducting demonstrations flights as opposed to commercial operations. As we've noted on the channel before, if you drive a modern EV, the chances are it has some form of advanced telecommunications in it to allow you to remotely interact with and monitor your car. But as we've also said plenty on the channel, getting some form of features like this in your EV opens you up to the possibility of data breaches. And this week, we heard that's exactly what happened earlier last year at Subaru. As published on Thursday, White Hat security experts Sam Curry and Shubham Shah have discovered a pretty egregious vulnerability in the Subaru Starlink connected vehicle service used by Subaru owners in North America and Japan. They said that they were able to access remote start, stop, lock and unlock functionality of customers' cars, retrieve personally identifiable information about current and previous owners and track vehicle location, all by knowing just a few key points about the victim's last name, address and other stuff. Like a previous hack they discovered, they could also associate new owners with vehicles without the owner's knowledge. It's important to note that Subaru Starlink is different from the satellite internet service of the same name, and Subaru patched the vulnerability back in November after being told about the exploit. Volvo has officially refreshed its EV lineup for 2025, making a few tweaks here and there and giving its XC40 recharge a new name. In the US, Volvo has officially launched the EX30 compact SUV with the extended range twin motor variant now available at dealerships in two different trim variants, both offering a claimed 253 miles or 407 kilometres of range per charge. A shorter range single motor variant is coming in the future. At the same time, Volvo confirmed the starting price of its EX90 for the 2025 model year in the US, coming in at just under $80,000 in seven seat guys and going up to just under $90,000 US in the highest spec trim. And in order to streamline its family of EVs, Volvo also rebadged its XC40 recharge to become the EX40. It's an easier, shorter name, but don't get too excited. The rest of the car is pretty much the same as it was last year, albeit with a slightly faster DC fast charge capability. The C40 recharge, its coupe sibling, won't be made this year. Last year wasn't a great year for electric two-wheelers. It doesn't look like 2025 is off to any better start, with Kiwi firm Ubico announcing on Monday that it had entered into receivership. The firm has made a name for itself by producing a range of utility and off-road capable motorcycles with an emphasis on practicality rather than top speed. 
To date, its all-wheel drive 2 by 2 models have found homes working on wildlife preserves, farms, and even in service with the military. While a deal announced last year with the Australian Postal Service looked like it would give Ubico a new revenue stream, working with delivery services around the world. But with the company now in the hands of receivers Grant Thornton, the signs are that the company may not survive. We will, of course, keep you abreast of the situation as it develops. But those close to the company suggest things aren't looking all that positive. He's hoping a new buyer is found. With all the not-so-great news we've covered today, I'm going to finish this segment with some good stuff. And let's start with a study that shows farmers don't even have to choose between growing crops and harvesting electrons. Despite what some misinformed politicians and groups might have you believe, installing photovoltaic solar panels in an agricultural application doesn't cause major issues for farmers, especially if the solar panels are two-sided vertical panels placed between each crop row. As detailed in a new exhaustive study from academics at the Aarhus University in Denmark, vertically placed dual-sided photovoltaic panels not only allow farmers to harvest energy while growing crops, but they also help provide shade during the hottest parts of the day, reduce wind speeds across the field and help maintain crop humidity levels throughout the day. The study hasn't been peer-reviewed yet but it is one of the first of its kind. And if you'd like us to dig deeper, let us know in the comments below. And finally for this segment, more good news, this time from researchandmarkets.com, which claims that it predicts the US electric vehicle market is still on track to grow despite, you know, it examined the EV marketplace in the US for 2024 and predicts it forward through until 2033. It estimates that EV sales will enjoy a compound annual growth rate, or CAGR, of just over 11% for the next eight years, reaching a market value of $537.53 billion US dollars by 2033. While the new administration in the US is likely to do some things in the coming years that will impact EV adoption rates, analysts at the firm suggest that current and future EVs, many of which fit into the 151 mile to 300 mile range segment, have allowed more people to switch to electric and, given increased concerns and awareness of fighting anthropogenic climate change, will continue to pave the way for future EV adoption. Ultimately, it paints a picture that suggests people have really lost all reasons not to go electric. And I really, really hope this report is right and that it is true for all markets around the world, including the Kiwi market. Before we get to the last two stories, I have a quick question. Are you in the market for a new EV? Because if you are and you live in Aotearoa, you should very much check out our very own buyer's guide over ecotricity.co.nz. It is packed with all the information you need to pick a car that's right for you and includes plenty of details about available vehicles, daily life with an EV, how to file and pay your RUCs and so much more. So follow the link below and start your journey today. Formula E is gearing up for the start of its latest season and for the very first time ever in the FIA race series, the vehicles will be able to get a quick power boost mid-race. Unlike the early series where drivers physically jumped out of one car and into another, this year's race series will leverage 600 kilowatt DC fast chargers to make it possible for cars to get approximately 3.85 kilowatt hours of boost to their battery packs in around 30 seconds. While that might not sound like a large amount of power, it's approximately 10% of the total energy storage capacity in this season's race cars, and it will make it possible for drivers to become a little more aggressive and engaged on the track without increasing the pack size for cars. The first race of the season with pit boost will take place on February 14th in Jeddah and I'm sure we'll hear more about the tech during the season. Sadly the race series isn't returning to Portland Oregon this year picking Miami Florida instead where much of our team are illegal now so we won't be able to attend this year. Sorry. And finally, regardless of what some might think about solar power, 
it's really difficult to dismiss the impact that affordable solar power has made on the modern world. But while ground-based solar energy is awesome, weather can impact generation capabilities, which is why scientists around the world have been looking into the possibility of using in-orbit solar farms combined with microwave power transmission to generate clean power all year round. A few years ago, scientists at Caltech demonstrated measurable microwave power transmission from a solar array in space for the very first time. And this week, we learned that China is readying its own space program to launch what it says will be a similar capacity generator to its Three Gorges Dam in central China. While this is early days, China's goal appears to install a solar array fitted with microwave power transmitters in a geostationary orbit some 36,000 kilometres above the Earth. The goal is certainly massive, but there's not a lot of data about how far along the project is. Because China is known for hyping things up on the international stage, only time will tell if this particular project will ultimately see the light of day. Or should that be the... The light of the sun, 24 hours a day. And on that note, we are done for today's show. Before I go, make sure you've hit the notification bell so you don't miss out in the latest in EV news from the channel. And if you haven't switched yet, it's high time to switch to Aotearoa's first and only climate certified renewable energy provider. It's super easy to make the switch and in doing so you'll help the nation wean itself off dirty energy and onto clean green power that will keep the land beautiful for generations to come. I'll be back next week but in the meantime do check out the lovely Gavin Kiwi EV Shoebridge on this very same channel. He's always got some fun video published so make sure you check it out. Until next time I'm Nikki Gordon Bloomfield. Thanks for joining me. Ka kite. See you next time.